Today we'll be discussing urinary tract infections in pregnancy. The following are the learning objectives. We're going to discuss the types and frequency of urinary tract infections in pregnancy. We're going to seek to understand the pathophysiology and microbiology of urinary tract infections in pregnancy. We're going to identify clinical presentations of urinary tract infections, try to understand the laboratory test involved in, u in diagnosing urinary tract infections, and finally describe the treatment of various urinary tract infections in pregnancy. Classifications of urinary tract infections include, first of all, asymptomatic bacteuria, where there are no symptoms and is typically diagnosed with a midstream urine collection. Acute cystitis is the second group of urinary tract infections where there are symptoms of lower tract infections and either a catheterized urine or a clean catch urine suggesting infection. And the final classification is acute pyelonephritis with symptoms of upper tract infection and a system systemic disease typically diagnosed with a catheterized urine collection. The prevalence of urinary tract infections in pregnancy is increased over the general population. Women with asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy number about 5 to 10 percent of the total pregnant population. Cystitis is about half of this at 1 to 3 percent and the incidence of pyelonephritis is about 0.5 to 2 percent of all pregnant women. 95% of asymptomatic bacteria cases are present at the first prenatal visit. This is the reason why all patients should be screened during that first visit for urinary tract infection in pregnancy. There are some associated risk factors that increase the prevalence of lower urinary tract infections. This includes those at ex extremes of age, particularly those with advanced maternal age over 35 those with advanced parity, women in the lower socioeconomic classes. If there are comorbidities such as sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease or preeclampsia, this increases the likelihood of lower urogenital tract infection. There are other factors that predispose to ascending infection and upper urinary tract infections. First is the mechanical pressure of an expanding uterus on the ureters. This gives physiologic hydronephrosis in almost every pregnant patient. As progesterone increases, it inhibits the peristaltic activity of ureteral smooth muscle cells, therefore setting up a situation prime for stasis and bacterial growth. In addition, there's decreased tone increased capacity, and incomplete emptying of the bladder, which leads to vesicoureteric reflux. There are also alterations in the physical and chemical properties of urine during pregnancy, which predispose to growth of bacteria, such as an elevated urinary pH, glycosuria, which enhances bacterial growth, Increased urinary excretion of estrogen, which accelerates E. coli growth. 20 to 40 percent of patients with untreated asymptomatic bacteria will develop acute pyelonephritis secondary to these factors we have just discussed. Pyelonephritis occurs primarily in the latter half of pregnancy for all of these reasons. The most common bacterial agents that are responsible for urinary tract infections are those that are responsible for urinary tract infections in the non-pregnant individual. The top three include E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, and Proteus species. There is a significant proportion of Streptococci, Staphylococcus, and Enterococci as well. When looking at the um, most likely agent, E. coli are responsible for between 75 and 80 percent of all urinary tract infections in pregnant women. The clinical manifestations vary greatly between the various classifications of urinary tract infections in pregnancy. Asymptomatic bacteria is just what it says. There are no symptoms. It is diagnosed purely by a positive urine culture. Acute cystitis, on the other hand, has a number of various symptoms that can show up in the pregnant gravida. Dysuria is one of the most common, an increase in frequency, an increase in urgency, 
There can be hesitancy or dribbling. Hematuria is sometimes present. Occasionally there is suprapubic pain and even a low-grade fever. With pyelonephritis, the clinical symptoms seem to be more systemic. There is almost always fever, greater than 38 degrees Celsius, often accompanied with chills. There's a degree of malaise, sometimes nausea and vomiting. The patient often complains of back pain, which is manifested on clinical exam by CVA tenderness. This is primarily on the right, 75% of cases. About 10% of cases are on the left flank, with 15% being bilateral. If the pain is bilateral, one ought to be thinking a urinary tract anomaly or perhaps a renal stone. There are frequently lower urinary tract symptoms. Preterm labor or contractions are often noted with acute pyelonephritis. And if severe with systemic uh, infection, there can be acute respiratory failure or even septic shock. Although there can be quite a large clinical suspicion for a urinary tract infection, particularly pyelonephritis, the crux of the diagnosis remains in the laboratory evaluation. All three types of urinary tract infections will have a urinalysis with both pyuria and bacteria. In addition, with pyelonephritis, you may notice white cell cast and a leukocytosis. A midstream clean catch can be done for asymptomatic bacteria, and some people will also use this for concerns about acute cystitis. There should be greater than 100,000 colonies per mil of whatever organism comes out of the urine to make this diagnosis definitively. In terms of pyelonephritis, it is much preferred to do a catheterized specimen, and many people would also prefer this for cystitis, finding greater than 100 colonies per mil to clinch the diagnosis. In managing both asymptomatic bacteria and cystitis, ultimate um, treatment should rely on the culture and sensitivity that was sent so that appropriate antibiotics could be given. However, in those patients with acute cystitis that are extremely symptomatic and you want to do empiric treatment, it is appropriate to use nitrofurantoin, 100 milligrams PO, BID, for at least three days, or Bactrim, DS, 1 PO, BID, for three days. These would cover the microorganisms that we discussed earlier. After treatment, the patient should be recultured within 7 to 14 days to assure that the antibiotic course cleared the infection. 30% of women with asymptomatic bacteria will not have clearing after their treatment and will need to be retreated. Those who have recurrence of either asymptomatic bacteria or cystitis, at least two episodes, should be offered antibiotic prophylaxis throughout the pregnancy either nitrofurantoin or cephalexin can be used daily to accomplish this. The management of pyelonephritis first of all requires inpatient observation and managing so that cultures can be returned and treatment can be tailored. However, patients typically warrant empiric treatment before cultures are available and we would choose a broad-spectrum antibiotic like ceftriaxam, a third-generation cephalosporin that covers the previously mentioned microorganisms. If the patient is not afebrile within 48 to 72 hours, an aminoglycoside can be added like genomycin, although you must be aware of fetal ototoxicity with prolonged use of the aminoglycoside like genomycin. IV antibiotics are typically continued until the patient is afebrile for 24 to 48 hours. Then the patient can be switched to oral antibiotics and frequently by this time a urine culture and sensitivity is back so that the antibiotic can be tailored. Antibiotics should be continued for a total of 10 to 14 days. During the first day or two, 
Tylenol will frequently be needed to keep the temperature down and therefore maintain fetal heart rate under a controlled setting between 120 and 160 beats per minute. During the initial workup, blood cultures may be obtained if it is felt the patient has an increased risk for sepsis. Both renal function, urinary output, and respiratory status should be monitored closely. If there is any question of respiratory symptoms, then a chest x-ray would be also warranted. IV fluid resuscitation with crystalloids to maintain adequate urinary output is extremely important. Urinary output should be maintained between 30 and 50 cc's per hour. Once the patient defervesces and an oral antibiotic is chosen, the patient may be discharged from the hospital to complete her uh, 10 to 14 day course of antibiotics. Antibiotic suppression is recommended for the remainder of the pregnancy following treatment with either nitrofurantoin 100 milligrams PO QHS or cephalexin 500 milligrams PO QHS. In addition, urine culture should be obtained every trimester until delivery to assure ourselves that there is no asymptomatic bacteria. This concludes the management, evaluation, definition, of urinary tract infections in pregnancy.